Start. Ah, okay. Okay. Click, Click here to start, start streaming. streaming. Going, Going live. Going live. Going live. You're live. You're live. Okay. okay. Does, Does the, the do the, do the people yeah. on YouTube okay. stream see it now? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Okay. So now, so now it says that I'm live, live and, and it should be possible, possible for, for for me to to, to go, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this, so this is, is a paper. paper um, uh, really, really, I, think, I, I sort of think, think of it as, as one of like a few papers, papers by Andreas et al. on um, constant, constant function market, market makers and their, their sort of, sort of uh, relation to convex optimization and, and like, like ways that convex optimization can be sort of sort of used to, to like, like as, as an, an how how how, how manipulating, manipulating constant function market, market makers can be an application of convex optimization. Um, so. Um, really, so this, so this is, the, is the, the paper, and really, and really one, of one of the things that I like about the paper, paper is that it's that very simple. simple, you know, um, not, not to, like, not to, like, like trash, trash the office of the paper, paper too much, but I really, really do feel, feel like, like you can really sort of get the entire gist of the paper just from, just from reading the abstract. The abstract. Um, um, really, the, the, the last sentence of the abstract is, I think, the sort of, the big sort of, you know, hit you in the face. The idea is that Lots, Lots of different, different what they what call multi-asset multi trades uh, can be can formulated, formulated, can be formulated as, as convex optimization problems. problems. And this and is this related, related to the fact that, that uh, constant, constant function market makers, makers are, are always these, these complex, complex things. things. Um, and, and because, because of, this, of this, further, further you, can you can always solve, solve them using sort of off-the-shelf off solvers. solvers. So, so let's, let's take a look at what this means and why this is sort of the case. So, so why, why is it the case, the case that every constant function function maker, maker, maker is, is complex? And, and, and what, what are, are all the like, like possible constant function function makers you can think of? Let's just sort of track, track, track that this, this, um, that this, that this assertion, assertion that the paper, that the paper is, making is making is sort of basically, basically true. true. Um, um, so, so the, the simplest, simplest constant function, function market, market maker, maker is probably the Uniswap one. This is the constant product market maker. And so we have this little equation here, which is R1 times R2 is greater than or equal to 1. Um, and, and so, so if, if we, we sort of zoom out of this equation, equation into, into this, this sort of plot, plot this, this is what the, the plot of, 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 of Uniswap looks, looks like. like. And I think, and I think if, if you've you know, spent, spent any time, time in DeFi, in DeFi you, probably you probably have seen a plot that looks something like this. this. So what, so I'm, what using I'm using with this, with this red, red dot here is to indicate that the current location or the current reserves of the, of the, of the Uniswap, Uniswap contract, contract, right? R1 and R2, they stand, they stand for, the for the reserves of the contract in certain, in certain currencies, currencies, right? It holds, it holds a certain, certain amount of R1 currency, holds a certain, it holds a certain amount, amount of R2 currency. Of R2 currency. Um, and, the and the thing that, that it's supposed, supposed to be constant, constant is that the, the, the product, product of those two things, R1 and R2, R2 is, um, is supposed to be quote-unquote equal to 1. However, something you'll notice that's sort of interesting about the way that it's been phrased in this particular image is that it's, it's formulated, formulated as R1 times R2, R2 is, greater is greater than or equal to 1. To one. You, know, you know, it's not actually, actually a constant product, product they're saying is greater than or equal to 1. Than one. Um, and they've and sort, they've of sort of highlighted this entire, this entire like, gray, gray region of all of the, the points, points that are sort of, sort of above, above this curve. curve. Um, um, and so and the so question, question, I guess the first question is, what does this shaded area represent? I don't know if people on the call want to give their own, give give. Give their, their sort of impression, impression of what, what, what the shaded, shaded area, area represents, represents as opposed, as opposed to like just, just the curve, curve below, below it. it. Amit, you answer. Maybe, 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 Relating it right. Yim Jin? Uh, I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, so why, why, don't why don't I like provide, provide my, my own answer, answer for what, what the gray area, area represents, represents? Right. Right. So the so the, the, the the, the, the black, black curve, curve right? right? This, this is, is the, 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 the space of places, places where the where reserves, reserves can end up after, after you, you do, do a trade. A trade. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, no, no. no. Amit, unfortunately, unfortunately, we can't, we can't hear you. I'm not sure what the, what the, what the, what the issue, issue is. is. Um, 
Um, um, but, but so, so if we think, we think of, the, of the, the black line, line as the, the, the set, set of places, places we could end up after, after doing, doing a trade, a trade you, could you could think, think of, of the gray, gray area, area as, as sort of the, the, the space, space of locations that the, the contract, contract would be, be happy, happy to end, end up, up at, at. right? right? Like, so, like, for, so for, for example, example right, right, if, 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 I, if, I, if I'm somewhere on this, this, this black, black line, line and I go and I either, either up, up or, or to the, to the right, right, then, then I, that, that means that I have strictly more money in, in either reserve, reserve two or reserve, reserve one, one than, than I have before. before. And so, and so the, the, the contract, contract is, 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 is pretty much, much hap, hap, like the, the, the only realistic place that they'll end up is someplace on the black curve because that's all that anyone wants to give them. But really, they would be happy to end up somewhere in the gray. Um, and, and in theory, in theory I, guess I guess they could, they end, could up end up in the gray, in the gray if, someone if someone was, was real, willing, willing to just, just you know, directly ERC-20 ERC transfer uh, uh, money to, to the contract. I haven't heard of that, that ever really, really being done, done but, but I, I, I suppose that's, that's something that you could do if you wanted to be generous and donate money to the liquidity providers on Uniswap or something. And so that's really what the gray region represents. It's sort of all of the like... All of, All the, of places the places that it that could, could end up, up if you were willing, willing to give, give money, money to the contract, the contract or, or, or generally, generally places, places. If you places, thought, if you thought of, of the smart contract as like having like wants, like wants and desires, desires, you could, you could think, think of it as like the places where the smart contract, contract, contract would be happy, would be happy to, end to end up. up. Um, and so that's so how that's I sort of think of the shaded area. And you'll notice that the gray area here is like a convex set, right? There's no, there's no like sort of bends, no place where it bends inward, right? It's sort of you know, you know, any any, any like point, point on the, on the, on the edge, edge of this, this you, know, you know, it's, it's all, all, all to one, one side of, 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 of this line, line here. here. Um, so, so let's, let's see what, what, I, what do I have next. next. Uh, uh, now, now uh, uh, yes. Yeah. So, so here, here I have, have Uniswap V3, v3 which, is which is another example of a constant, constant function market, market maker. maker. Um, um, I think Uniswap V3, it actually came out after the sort of first paper in the series. But, but to, to like, like I'll, I'll, I'll give the, the audience, audience like a few, a few moments, moments to sort of conjecture, conjecture what, what the the the, the what, what the area, area the gray area, area is going to look like here, here right? right? You can, you see, can what see what the what formula, formula is. is. The formula basically has these plus, plus one half terms, terms to sort of to shift, shift it over. It over. The, sort the sort of idea, idea of Uniswap V three is that is instead, instead of you know distributing the liquidity throughout the entire space. Sorry, wait, what? Because the switch is doing like an echo thing. Yeah, okay, but so if I mute this mic, is yeah, it's still good. You're saying that because, yeah, okay. Can people on the stream here, though? I, I'm no, not sure if that's the case. Yeah, um, definitely, it seems that there's audio from the screen capture. Presumably the screen capture audio is coming from Zoom because Zoom is making noise, potentially. That doesn't actually make a lot of sense to me because it wouldn't be picking up uh, my voice. Perfect now. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, final answers are in. So what does the Uniswap V3 version of the sort of gray region look like? Um, it looks like this. So basically, the point is that, you know, instead of a, a sort of curve that goes infinitely off asymptoting closer and closer, it, it's basically sort of restricted to this range. And this was sort of the idea of Uniswap v3. They were There were people, I guess, who didn't want to be providing liquidity at, like, ridiculous price levels of, you know, a thousand Ether or, like, one ether for one dollar. They didn't want to provide liquidity for that because that's the sort of ridiculous price that no one expects will happen. And so they wanted to sort of be able to restrict it. And so they came up with this sort of uh, these sort of small ranges of liquidity where you can provide liquidity in. Um, and so this is what the 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 price curve looks like. Basically, it's just the previous price curve, but shifted down into the left a little bit. Um, but to reflect the fact that you can't go less than zero in your R2 reserves and you can't go less than zero in your R1 reserves sort of cuts off at the X and Y axis. Um, so that's that's Uniswap V3. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, ah, yes, I just have a little sort of point here to make, which is that, you know, when the liquidity goes beyond the tick, that's sort of 
corresponds to you like running out of money in one of your reserves, right? So the, the little red dot can sort of inhabit any space on this sort of short curve here. It doesn't really go off into this, this other space. Um, okay, so there are other forms of, of, com of convex market makers, constant function market makers, and one of them is the balancer. So that so balancer's key difference from Uniswap is it introduces these weights, right? So instead of just R1 times R2, um, it's going to be R1 to the power of W1 and R2 to the power of W2. And the, the point of the point of this W1 and W2 is that they're sort of there to, you know, in case there was uh it's basically to, to make some assets more important than others, basically. I think one of the one of the key ideas behind the sort of weighting scheme is that you can actually include much more than just two um, assets in a single curve, um, or in a, in a single you know in a, a single smart contract. And the the idea is that you, there are some assets that maybe are not so important, and you can weight those very small, and the other assets you can weight large. Um, and so, what does the what does it look like in this case? Um, well, basically, it looks very similar to Uniswap, but it's sort of warped and stretched a little bit. Um, and that, like my sort of representation here is not like totally accurate of a warping and stretching, but you, I guess you can take my word for it that even market makers like this, you know, the 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 gray area is sort of a convex shape. Um, there's no sort of inward bumps. It's all sort of very smooth. Moving on. There's a there's yet another kind of of market maker in existence, which is this sort of stable swap market maker. You could also maybe call it a sum market maker. And the difference is now instead of you know multiplying the reserves, we're just adding the reserves, right? R1 plus R2 is greater than or equal to one. And the point is that this is supposed to be like a good option for for stable coins. I think that they sort of, you know, there are sort of slight tweaks on this, which is what they actually use for stable coins. But you can think, you know, if I've got like USDC and I've got DAI, the point is that they're both supposed to be equal to $1. And so, you know, I'm basically indifferent. I, I you know, you give me one of the, uh, give me a dozen of one, six half, dozen, uh, you know, half dozen of the other is, is basically the same. Um, and so what does this uh, gray region look like? Uh, so it basically looks like this, right? Because it's a you know it's sum, it's just this linear portion. Um, but again, we run into the sort of constraint that you can't have less than zero of R one, and you can't have less than zero of R two. So again, it sort of cuts off at these little corners here. Um, and so now that we sort of run the gamut of of constant function market makers, maybe it's sort of even to like really drive this point home. And this is another point that's not necessarily in the paper itself. But like think about just limit orders, right? Something that's like not even really associated with De DeFi at all, right? Limit order is sort of like a traditional concept in finance. The, the idea of a limit order is I just want to sell my asset at a given price. And like, let's say that I'm I'm also fine with like, you know, selling half of the asset at that price if, if that is the deal that's available to me. And so what's the, my question now is what would the curve for this uh, for like a limit order look like. Let's say I wanted to build a smart contract that would be a very simple smart contract. It would just be, I put my money into the smart contract and then the smart contract executes the limit order for, for me, right? If anyone comes along and wants to fill my limit order, smart contract will, will allow them to trade uh, at that price that I set. Um, otherwise, uh, otherwise my, my smart contract will just sit, sit there. So the question is, what would the curve for the limit order smart contract look like. Um, and to like, you know, pause for after like a pause for five seconds, it's actually just this exact same as the sum market maker, right? The only real difference is that, you know, with the limit order, the sort of red dot is always here at the corner. And the, and the point is that, you know, as I sort of move forward, I change the, the space of the, of the gray to sort of reflect that I don't want to go backwards. Um, so that would be what a, a limit order would be. And it, you can sort of think of this as similar to, to Uniswap because Uniswap does charge like a small fee. And so if I like were to if I were to scroll all the way back to, to Uniswap back here, um, you 
it's actually not a perfect hyperbola of this curve. Really, there's like some small fee that's charged. And so it's actually slightly inward of the, the hyperbola. And as you move, the, the, the point is that the sort of gray region is supposed to keep moving up and to the right in order to make sure that the people who are look, providing liquidity get some nice returns on their investment. Um, but the, so the, the option or, or the thing I guess I'm trying to express is that it is the case maybe that sometimes as time goes on, you know, like the the we can sort of evolve into smaller and smaller gray regions as our our smart contract is will it is sort of like getting closer and closer to what it wants. But at any given moment, I think the important thing to remember is that it's always sort of this convex function. Um, and so this is, I guess, one of the, the like the sort of main observation. What, what does the bottom mean? I'm still trying just to work that out. That's just if your limit order doesn't, you, you aren't offering to sell everything in your account. It's like, that's your total balance. And if you just make a small limit order, you're, you're only offering to sell half of your. Right, right. So I guess what is, yeah, this is the, maybe the first, the limit order in this form is maybe the first time we've seen like this, this white region sort of below the red dot. And the way that I would interpret that white region is, there is an absolute minimum amount of R2 that I want to be sure that I hold, right? I never want to go below five units of R2 mm -hmm. because if I placed a limit order and it's been partially filled, and I so I now have five units of R2, I, I don't want to go backwards and give up that R2 to get back more R1, right? The point of a limit order is I'm sort of trying to exchange my R1 for R2. And so the point of of like deleting the gray region below is that I don't want to go back and get 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 the R1 back that I had before. Uh, isn't the R here like represent the reserve amount rather than? Yeah. Yeah, so the like the R1 and so this is basically a two dimensional chart that shows like very every point on this chart is like a certain amount of R1 and R2 that the smart contract could have at any given time. Yeah, and so the, the the boundary represents what you, you know you would, what you would typically have as the trades that you you get, or as the it's like all the possible trades that you could make with it. But you're saying that it kind of has a time varying thing, like as you move towards one thing, you want to stop, not be able to go back. But that that doesn't seem like that's what's captured here. Well, it's it's what's captured in the difference between sorry the like the starting process of the limit order and the finishing process of the limit order. Like if I were to extend this, like, so basically this is a sequence in time. It starts like this. Oh, I see it now. It, can, it it proceeds to this. And if I wanted to go even further, I could create a, thir a further slide yeah. where the, the red dot would be all the way up here. And that would mean that the red dot has, you know, it's all, of its, all of its money is in the form of R2 now. It holds zero R1 and the limit order has been completed. And at that point, all you can really do is like directly give the smart contract money. It's not really open to any further like trade of one thing for another. I see it now that when you flip back it and catch that. Yeah. Okay. So just another uh, observation, which is what does a limit order book look like? So I guess this is, again, this is something that's more common in traditional finance than in um then in DeFi, I, it's sort of been explained to me that the reason limit order books are more common in traditional finance is because that like the big constraints on compute that like decentralized computation requires, um, you know, you have to have these sort of CM, uh, CFMMs because the amount of compute that it would take to iterate through a list of orders and, and find all the correct ones to fill is, is too much compute to spend when you're running on a blockchain. Um, but you can still think of the the ideas in this paper as as being relevant, and in you know maybe with rollups and blockchain scaling, this will be something that's reasonable. So let's suppose that I have a limit order book that has two orders in it, and the orders are at different prices. So so let's just think through a little bit what are the prices that are being represented here. So this first one, the slope is meant to be a little steeper. And that is representing the, the fact that the, the limit order on this side is willing to give up less R2, or, or sorry, it's willing to give up less R1, and it wants more R2 in exchange for that R1. So the, the left-hand side is a limit order that's a little bit greedier, and the right-hand side is a, a, 
a limit order that's a little bit less ambitious, right? It's willing to give up more R1 in exchange for less R2. So I have these two limit orders. They're both in the same order book. The question is, what does the order book as a whole now look like, right? I could think about, you know, what is it going to look like if I if I want to be able to make a trade and I'm I'm allowed to to trade against both of these, right? What is their sort of combined um their sort of li combined liquidity provision going to look like? I mean, I was thinking it was going to look like a depth chart somehow, but it, it can't look like that because first of all, these are only still in the same direction, right? So at most it's one side of a depth chart. And I'm used to each one being like a little limit, but like a little step, but here even a limit order is a sequence. So it's like going to be a, I don't know, a shifted right. step function. Or... So, I mean, the depth chart, that is a, a good observation because like, I would say that this, this sort of slide doesn't really come from the from the main paper at that mm -hmm. whose title I mentioned at the beginning of the, this, this talk. This this slide actually comes more from a different paper from Angeris et al. called the convex geometry of market makers. Mm -hmm. um, and that basically that paper is another paper that's all about this sort of correspondence between the geometry and the algebra, right? So I would say that the the depth chart that's another way of sort of visualizing these things. The depth chart is more of like an algebraic form. Whereas this is the more of the geometric form. Um, so what does the combination look like? Um, it looks like this. So basically it, it's, there's this concept called the Minkowski sum of two sets. And the point is I take any point on the right and any po point on the right bottom, sorry, any point on the right top and any point on the right bottom. And I add those two points together and that makes a gray point over here. And so what is this like what is this sort of weird like shape that I have here? Well the point is that you know the 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 first thing that I'm going to do when I come to this this limit order book is I'm first going to trade against the less ambitious um order because the less ambitious order is giving me a better price. And so basically I come along here, I get to this and I do all of my trades here first. So the slope of this part this part it's going to match the slope of this part of the combined limit order book. And then once I've completely filled that order, now I have to move on to the, to the more greedy order. And I have to fill their order now if I want to get my um, if I want to get any R1. And so that sort of corresponds to this more steep part. But the point is that basically the I've I've taken so, so the I guess the sort of idea is the red dot here and the red dot here they add up to this other red dot, if you think about them as vectors in this sort of vector space, the R1, R2 vector space. If I think about this red, uh, if I think about the top of this triangle and the bottom of this triangle, those as vectors add up to this sort of little kink here. And the, the top part of this triangle and the top part of this triangle, those add up to this kink here and it's sort of linear between them. And so this is this is basically this operation called the Minkowski sum. And this is yet another sort of big sort of fa fact that sort of is, is emphasizing the fact that we can do this convex optimization. The, the Minkowski sum operation is an operation that preserves the convexity. And so you can think like, no matter how many orders I have in this liter limit order book, I can just take the Minkowski sum of all of their sort of liquidity profiles, and I can get a big convex representation of all of the liquidity in that limit order book. And, you know, furthermore, I could even do that if I additionally to limit orders in this order book, there could also be, you know, a traditional Uniswap constant function market maker that sits alongside the orders in this order book. And I could even take the Minkowski sum of that shape with mm -hmm. the shape that I have here. And I would again get something that would be convex, and that would, I guess, the 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 upshot of that is it would be a little bit curved at that point, but it would still be a convex shape. So we have all of these um, convex, you know, shapes that we've seen, um, and we have like more justification for the fact that it seems like pretty much every constant function market maker we come across is going to be convex, and just to like answer this question, maybe from a sort of more financial perspective, why is it the case that all of these turned out to be convex? I mean, did no one ever try to make like a non-convex one just to see how it worked? And perhaps this is the answer. There's this concept in, in like in investing called being risk averse or, or risk neutral, right? 
most in most cases in economics, you are going to prefer a situation where you are not taking a gamble over a situation where you are taking a gamble, right? If there's two possibilities. And so this sort of this sort of justifies why none of these things are concave or, or why all of these liquidity profiles, I guess I'll call them, are, are convex. It's because if they were not convex, that would sort of imply that there would be a certain amount of, there would be a certain point that where I would actually prefer to sort of take a risk with my money and like do a gamble where I could where I could sort of spread out to two other points. Um, perhaps that like, you know, maybe it would have been helpful to have like include sort of a slide on this as well. Um, it made sense, but I don't see where that's going just because the risk, uh, yeah, I don't see any risk in the... Well, the, the, I mean, the point is that, the point is that like in the real world, entities are always risk averse because the entities that are not risk averse have taken risks and either destroyed themselves or like ascended to a new plane of ex existence, basically. Okay. Um, like so, I, I, that that's sort of like my, my interpretation of like why why do we never see like entities in the world that are like risk risk loving or I guess is what you would call them. I mean, like Investopedia doesn't like really have a term for that. It's like they have a term for risk averse, and there's mm -hmm. also a risk neutral. But but yeah. I guess the the point is that this sort of it's it's sort of like a nice like justification for the fact that it seems like pretty much everyone in the world, all the smart contracts, all the programmers that program them, all of the people who are DeFi traders. Um, well, maybe DeFi traders would be a good example of a risk loving yeah, uh, agent, but like from from economic principles, they should probably be risk averse, right? Okay. Yeah. How will that connect to convexity? Um, it's just yeah. So like. Maybe maybe yeah, what would it look like if it were non-convex? Like it would right. So what is what is the definition of convexity? So the def I've like probably <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, I probably should have like included the definition. But a set is convex if any line segment with endpoints in the set um is completely contained within the set. Um so like here, why don't I like draw? Yeah, why don't I like like quickly draw, in fact? So well, you know, I mean, I'm I'm okay with the the high level. I think the intuition of convexity is clear enough here. But I mean, let's just talk through what a non-convex would look like. And actually, to me, the intuition is um, here. I think of these as convex because the more you trade against an AMM or a limit order book, um, you get a worse and worse price. But in a way, sometimes you also get a bulk discount. And I would think a bulk discount would look convex, non-convex. Like it would no longer be convex if I think you started to get a better price if you bought more. Yeah. I mean, that's that's another it's sort of like diminishing diminishing returns for the concept of like um supply and demand, right? The yeah. more the more you supply, the less able people are to like meet that supply and therefore the less um the less they are able to supply and so the price should get steeper and steeper, right? As you're buying more and more, there are like the people who you're trading against. I mean, in some ways like the the whole so there's like the greedy person and the less greedy person. In reality, there's a whole spectrum of greedy and not greedy people, and the the more you trade, the more you're running running up into against the people who really are committed to one asset or the other, and the the higher you have to raise your price. Um, right. I, I, the point that I was trying to get out with the gambling thing is that you can imagine that if the endpoints of this line were in the gray, and the middle of of the point was in the in the white, mm -hmm. right? You could imagine like at that point. You could you could go to like a casino and you could like gamble, you know, if you were right in the middle, you could go to a casino and you could gamble and you could say, okay, if the head, if the coin flips heads, give me like all of the R2, like transfer my half half of my R1 into R2. And if the coin flips tails, transfer half of my R2 into R1. And that would be a gamble that the casino would be perfectly fine with because in expectation, they would have the same amount of R1 and R2 as they started with. Whereas you would, um, but like, I mean, you are like a smaller person, you you sort of care more about risk. And so probably you like, if you were the sort of, per, if I guess the, my point is, if you were the sort, sort of person that wanted that, you would actually be fine because you could just go to the casino and get that afterwards, right? You, you, you could just take in some sense, the convex hull of your preferences um, 
Could you go to the line and draw? I mean, let's let's draw a price curve or one of these that is non-convex. I mean, and then yeah, I think I can see how to translate your. Um, the problem is, I didn't like to that. I didn't draw this by. Um, yeah, you could just take a couple line segments on a blank sheet, even. But yeah, yeah, let's let's let let's create like a blank, blank line. So, so here's my x-axis, and here's my y-axis. And let's like let me now draw a picture of a of a non-convex curve. So the non-convex curve might look something like this. It would like it would juke inwards and then it would go down again. Uh-huh. And then it would go off this way. And the reason that this would be non-convex is because it would, it would be it, it's the fact that there's this sort of interior region here which is in this sort of little nook, right? The, the, the reason it's convex is I can draw this line segment where the endpoints of the line segment are to the up and right of the curve, but the, the curve nevertheless passes outside of the, of the gray region, which is supposed to be up here. Mm -hmm. And so this is like, so this would be an example of, the, of a non-convex curve. And the reason like, yeah, I see the thing about the casino, the, the just casino because, I, mean, I, I think the intuition of the casino is that if you take a random, if you're willing to do randomized things, like get yourself in a position where with, you know, half yeah. probability you're there and half probability you're there, then that's a way you can basically cause yourself to lie outside that region just by, you know, gambling. I mean, maybe like side payments is another way. I mean, it. I do think that this resembles like if you now buy even more, you start to get a discount. You still have to pay for the more you get, but you get at a better rate if you you know trade enough. And I right. guess the idea is you could always team up with someone else and split the difference on a larger order. So right, like like here's the thing. Let's let's suppose that there were two people that were in this exact position, right? Let's say that you're in the position in the very middle, right? And there was someone else who was exactly like you, right? They were also in the middle and they also had the same preference curve. Mm -hmm. What you could do is you could simply go to that person and make a deal. You could say, okay, let's pool ourselves together and I'll go to the top and you'll go to the bottom. And that would be perfectly acceptable. That would be, you know, I will give you my R1. You will give me your R2. That will put me at the top here. Mm -hmm. It'll put you at the bottom here, but we're both more happy because now we're both above and to the right of our curve, whereas before we were below and to the left of our curve. I mean, is, is it fair to then say that this is um, this convexity assumption is a without loss of generality kind of thing? It's not like we're saying this theory is only going to work for convex functions, but rather even if you didn't have a convex one, you could basically, I don't know what you would call this transformation, like make a derivative AMM that, not a derivative, like a token backed by a derivative, but... Um, yeah, this will be an interesting discussion. Let me like continue with the second half of my yeah, slideshow it. presentation, and then I will like come back to this question because this is something that I think people. I'm going to, the the baseline implications is that because all these things are convex, we can use the tool of convex optimization. Um, so I mean, there you know you can take whole courses on convex optimization. The point is that what we have is a problem where there are certain amounts of money that we can give to each of the exchange DeFi exchanges that are in existence, and we can get certain amounts of money from them. And there is going to be certain, um, and those, those variables, right, how much we give, how much we get, those are all going to be variables in a big convex optimization problem. And because, you know, all the curves are convex, the optimization problem will be indeed a convex optimization problem. Um, and this is very nice because we have a lot of tools and a lot of reasons to think that many forms of convex optimizations are, are, are solvable in like polynomial time using these open source tools. In fact, for some, like somehow I had it in my head before today that every single convex optimization problem could be solved in polynomial time. Apparently that's not true. I was actually surprised to learn that there are like sort of exotic forms of, of convex optimization problems that are not polynomial time solvable. But I, my understanding is that like most vanilla um, forms of convex optimization are in fact solvable. And I think this includes basically everything we saw in the last few slides. Um, so this is very nice. We can solve things through convex optimization. So what can we solve through convex optimization? Here would be one example of something we could do. Let's say that I have 
X amount of A coin and I want to trade it all for B coin to get as much B coin as possible. That would be an example of a convex optimization problem because there would be a variable like how much am I, how much B coin am I getting from each one of these exchanges? How much A coin am I sending to them? Right. There's another version would, would be, let's say that I want a certain amount of B coin. Like, let's say that that's the entry fee to some like nice metaverse, whatever. I don't know how the metaverse works. How much A coin do I have to spend to get that B coin? That would be another version, sort of like a sort of a dualistic version of the, of the same convex optimization problem. Another version could be, let's say that I have some belief about like the relative worths of certain coins. Let's say that C coin plus D coin equals E coin. Um, then like there's a question of how many E coin should I sell if I'm using the proceeds to buy equal amounts of C coin and D coin? This would be like an arbitrage opportunity. If there's some sort of arbitrage opportunity in existence where I can trade my E coin and get more C coin, D coin combinations, then that would be a, a, good, a good arbitrage trade, trade to make. And so there are some examples like like what is what are financial assets that look like this? Well, like put options with the underlying and the call options, I think are supposed to work this way. Um, that's like not exactly true. There's this sort of discounting, but it's this is roughly true. There's also this sort of prediction market um, e explanation. Like so, there's C coin could be a candidate one wins, D coin could be the other candidate wins, and E coin could be like one dollar. So if I win one dollar, if one candidate wins and one dollar. If the other candidate wins, I'm just going to get a dollar. It's the same thing. Um, so that's like yet another example. And here's another example that they came up with from the paper. This is Markowitz trading. This is like the sort of, you know, the this is like the premier uh, premier form of of portfolio management from like the 60s and 70s, I guess. The idea is that if you know the correlations of the returns for all of the assets that you're willing to trade to trade on, then maximizing the, your sort of risk adjusted returns is itself a, an optimist convex optimization problem. Basically there's, you know, there's a lot of math involving sort of multiplying by covariance matrices, but that's like, it's, it turns out to be yet another example of a convex optimization problem. Um, and yeah, so you could think about it sort of as repositioning yourself to minimize your risk while still getting a certain expected return. You could like, there's also like the risk adjusted return, which is, you know, you value, like you, you basically don't want a very high variance, but at the same time you do want a high return. So, so that's, that's mark which trading basically. Okay. So what are like other potential applications? Um, one application is like the predict prediction markets this is this is something that i've just observed from my own sort of trading on uh plain money prediction markets in particular this like platform manifold the the thing that they do is they allow people to make their own questions um but what that sort of res results in is a lot of duplicate questions unfortunately so like you can see that like dozens of people have made the same market on whether joe biden is going to be the democratic party nominee and dozens of people have made the same market on whether bitcoin is going to reach a new all time high so maybe something could be like, and so basically you can bet on each of these markets, but like all the all of the prices are slightly different. You have to shop around for the right price. It's sort of sort of silly. Really, there should be something where I could trade on one market and it would automatically, you know, split my liquidity over all of the equivalent markets. And maybe that's something that this this platform could do if they wanted to like make sure everyone was getting very good trades when they traded on these things. Um, and then there's the the sort of like further idea, which is this, I don't like suave, I there's these weird people on the internet have come up with this um, idea for for basically like handling MEV. I think it's pronounced um, suave. Suave, yeah. Um, so basically, so here's a quote from the from the the suave website, which is that it's sort of this uh, preferences. It, it's also, I think sometimes called an intense based architecture. Um, I'm not sure if that's the same idea or just a related idea, but the idea is that users are going to come with their, their transactions and they're going to have, instead of telling the platform to simply execute a very specific transaction, they're going to express their, their transactions as a, as a preference over some things that they, they could possibly want. Um, and that would be like this message that would send a preference and then the MEV platform would, would you know, combine those preferences in such a way that everyone would um, basically everyone would sort of get what they want. 
And so this convex optimization framework seems like it's like it's potentially could be a very good way of doing that preference ag aggregation, right? Like we've sort of established in the first part of this that it seems like people really have convex preferences. And if they all do have convex preferences, then what we can do is we can use convex optimization to find the, you know, find the, the thing that makes all of them like simultaneously satisfied. Um, and so perhaps this could be, you know, I think the other, the, the other like platform that I know of is like cow swap, co coincidence of wants uh, swap. And that's another sort of like example of an intense space architecture. And I think they even call, sometimes they even call them like solvers, right? So like you, you could, you, you could, you can basically, you can make a solver for every single one of the, um, for, for, for every one of these like convex solvers, you could make a solver maybe that would, would slot into these ecosystems. Of course, I don't know exactly what, what it involves to make a solver. Um, but maybe this could be like a, it could be like a specialized subsection of one of these protocols or, or something like that. Um, so that would be a, um, so that's the, that's the like end of my slides. I have a few like related watchings that people can watch if they want to, but to, to get back Andrew to your, your question about like, what can we like, what can we do with this sort of like gambling idea? I mean, the, the one thing that didn't really satisfy me about this suggestion was that, you know, you have these, uh, like these limit orders, right? You have these limit orders, but what happens if your trade only gets half executed yeah. by one of these things? And that seems like something that would be a sort of like a bad user experience. It's like, okay, I had, I had X E, I had one die and I wanted one, one USDC, but now I have half of a die and half of a USDC and I can't do anything with either of those. So maybe like a way of solving that issue would be that like, if, you know, if in one block, you get this sort of like botched, um, like half executed trade, maybe you could go on in the next block to do something where you sort of pair up people whose trades have been botched like that. Mm -hmm. And you like, and you like get them to participate in this like convexification process to like make sure that, okay, it's going to take one more block, but at the end of the day, you're going to get either one of one or one of the other. Um, so maybe, so, maybe so that's do like the, do the, I see, is that a, so limit orders are convex. Uh, well, they're at least convex when they are partially fillable. But yeah, I, when, I know on centralized yeah. exchanges, you know, fill or kill versus partial fill is, um, you know, an option. Right. And I guess in AMMs, okay, but with AMMs with Uniswap, it is, it is, it's not really right. With, well, the, with the mechanism, Uniswap acts convex. But yeah. if you with with Uniswap, it's like basically impossible to sort of end up with Uniswap. It's like a smooth. Um, strongly convex curve. So, I mean, if you, there, there's sort of the question is like, I wonder what, like, what is the, what do people really want, right? If you, like, the, the I guess the sort of central question is, if I am a DeFi trader doing this thing, do I actually want to be partially filled or do I want this like fill or kill where, where I either am totally filled or not filled at all? I mean, I'd assume it's it makes sense obvious. to present as an option. I feel like it some of sense. the intent systems, like I, I know that this has come up a bunch with, um, I think Anoma, I ask them frequently about like partial fills and there's like something in there to have that. But I mean, if it's an option, I mean, is it enough to say that it's an option to users to be able to make orders that are either fill or kill or um, can be partially filled? Or, I mean, are you saying that that makes a consequence for whether they are suitable for convex optimization. So I mean it's, I think I think that the partial fills is sort of critical for it to be convex. Uh -huh. If it's if it is a deal where you want to be totally filled or you want to not be filled at all, then you would be non-convex because you would sort of look um to go back to our example. The the thing that you would be describing there would be a, a profile where you go vertically down and then like straight across and then vertically down again. Um, that that's that's how I think it would look like if you did this sort of um, fill or kill paradigm. Uh, so that would definitely be, not be convex. But but I guess the point is like maybe like you can take advantage of this thing that's sort of like convex. Non convexity seems to be like a little bit irrational in some ways. Mm -hmm. You can like if you if you truly are not, 
in a, in a non-convex situation, then there are ways of getting out of that situation by either gambling or finding someone else who's in the same situation. Yeah. Um, so it seems like, um, it seems possible at least that, that there might be a way of sort of satisfying that, that niche by like, you know, sort of closing the loop on, on the thing that is like making them be convex or, or something like that. Um, yeah, that I mean that's would be something that would require sort of a little bit more understanding about the like people who are making these and, and like the reasons for them wanting particular prices. I mean, I guess like the canonical example is like you want to buy a house and therefore you need a lot of capital present to buy a house. So you want to either be fully invested in the like in the you know foreign currency you need to buy this house or or you want to not be invested in it at all because it's not useful to you otherwise. Um, and you can't solve the problem by going to a casino and then having one out of 20% yeah, of a house. I mean, yeah. The, the casino is sort of like a, maybe a bad metaphor because it sort of implies that you would be like losing money and expectation. I mean, the, the, the sort of point is that it would be, it would be, it would be a gamble between if, if 20% of my limit order is filled, I would then be able to go to someone and either have an 80% chance of reverting it or a 20% chance of continuing to go all the way. Right. Yeah. So I, I'm still, I'm still going back and forth between my like two goals, but it's just like a, a probabilistic outcome. I mean, like maybe, maybe the better question to ask is why can't I just continue to leave my limit order on the market until it either gets totally filled or totally, um, totally reverted. And I think the answer to that question is, you know, you're starting to get into the territory, like people usually don't want that because they like price slippage, right? It's yeah. like sort of like the market, you, you will be at an information disadvantage to the market if you're doing that, because people will know which one is actually going to be worth more in the end. They'll have a little bit more information. Um, whereas with with this other proposal, you would, you would only be like trading in the first block, right? Um, and then if, if this sort of like casino entity were were liquid enough you would be guaranteed to be able to like finish your um finish your trade uh like in a risk free like without without risking that you would be going in the way of the less um the less worthy asset yeah. basically uh so anyway that's the uh whole talk um maybe i'll uh Turn off the stream. Thanks for thanks to anyone who joined.